Hey everyone, this is Stephanie Wong, Cloud Developer Advocate, and today I have the pleasure to sit down with Bruno Aziza, Google Cloud's Head of Data Analytics, to talk about what customers have taught us about the future of data. And today we're going to be talking about how some customers have achieved incredible results with data, the best and the worst practices, and touch on topics like how many data people should your company hire? How should your data and analytics department work and who should they report to? And what do most modern architectures look like? But first, for those of you who don't know you yet, Bruno, can you give us a quick intro of what you've been up to? Well, thanks for having me here, Stephanie. Uh, you're right, I specialize in everything data, AI, and analytics. And this uh, world of data has been part of my life for the last three decades. Uh, before working here at Google, I worked at companies like Business Objects after we went IPO and before I was acquired by SAP. I most recently was at Oracle when uh, my team led one of the fastest turnarounds in, in the business intelligence industry. I had the opportunity to launch startups like Alpine Day Labs, so it was bought by Tibco, SciSense, AdScale, and I also helped Microsoft grow its business unit for data uh, to a billion dollars. Great, so we all know that you are very busy before and now at Google Cloud. So tell us a little bit about your role here and what you do here at Google. That's true, I'm busy, but it's busy good. And uh, simply my, my team really uh, is split into three main responsibilities. The first one is engaging with customers and partners. You know, we spend about 60 to 70% of our time within the community. The second is our product strategy and execution, our launches, our new products. And I know we're gonna talk about a few here today. And then of course, everything related to go to market globally. You know, how do we make it easy for our customers to onboard and consume the value of our services, transform and innovate? Uh, you know, I've been here now about a year, having a blast working with a lot of the people I've worked with previously in the industry. Right, so you have spent a lot of time with customers. So what are some of the key trends that you've been seeing? There are lots of problems, but that also means there's a lot of opportunities in this field. You know, one of the biggest challenges that data executives have today is how do they turn into a competitive advantage this immense, fast growing, fast moving amount of information that their organization and their customers and their partners, and their ecosystem in a way is, is creating. Now, of course, you know about data growth, you know, uh, according to IDC, 175 zettabytes of data will be created in the next five years. If you're wondering what a zettabyte is, it's 21 zeros, so it's a lot of data. You know that our data production has increased by more than 10x over the last eight years. And in fact, 90% of the data in the world uh, that has been created has been created over the last 10 years. So when it comes to turning this data into business outcomes and business values, you know, the situation is quite alarming. You look at stats in the industry, close to two thirds of the data produced is actually never being analyzed and almost 70% of organizations are unable to realize tangible and measurable value from data. And 90% of employees say that their work is slowed down by data they just can't rely on. So Bruno, we've known each other for a little while now. And one thing that stands out is that I know that you eat, breathe and sleep data and analytics. So I want to ask you more of a philosophical question since you're so ingrained in it. What is one thing that CDOs or CIOs or other leaders in this space should keep in mind when thinking about the future in the data space? Well, thank you, Stephanie. Actually, there are at least three things they should keep their mind on. The first one, we talked a little bit about it before, this idea of multi-cloud. You gotta build your system assuming your data is going to be across a hybrid environment, on-prem as well as multiple clouds. The second aspect of your strategy should incorporate real-time as a foundational piece of your architecture. You know, no longer are organizations going to differentiate themselves by working with data in batch. And then finally, embedding machine learning is an important way that you're going to democratize access to data for everyone. If you are a CDO or a chief data officer or a CIO, chief information officer, how many data people should your company hire in order to stay competitive? Yeah, this is a really tough question because leaders often say that, you know, the source of their competitive advantage comes from their people, not just their services or their products. And if that's true, then the best way to tell what your company's core competency is, is to look at, you know, the footprint of your employees and, and their function. And so if, if you look at companies like Wayfair, for instance, you know, recently in the press, they claim that they had 3,000 engineers and data scientists. Now, out of their total employee base, 
that's close to 18%. Now you're probably sitting here and thinking, well, that's not a traditional company. Wayfair is an online, you know, digital uh, data first organization. But then you look at banks and more traditional organizations like uh, DBS Bank, for instance. Their CEO, their CEO recently uh, was quoted in the press saying that we're now increasingly seeing or thinking of ourselves as a technology company offering financial services rather than a traditional bank. And the fact that we have twice as many engineers than banker is perhaps a testimony to the shift in the nature of the company that we are. So if you think about that, you have to ask yourself, you know, how many data employees should you employ as a percentage of your total employee base? And here, what we've learned from the community, and here I've got to give credit to Kirk Bourne, he's a chief scientist officer at Data Prime, and has come up with some really interesting, I think, useful uh, ratios. You know, according to him, approximately 100% of your employees should be data literate, and that makes sense. That's the ability to recognize, understand, and talk data. We want everyone to be literate when it comes to reading data, if you will. A third should be data fluent. So what that means is the ability to analyze and create arguments and present results with data. And about 10% should be data professionals. So now that means they are paid to create value from data. So now roles like chief scientists, uh, data analysts, uh, BI specialists kind of fit in that category. So what I would tell your customers here is that, you know, if you're listening here, what is your percentage today? You know, according to these ratios here, and what do you think it should be so you can innovate with data? Yeah, that's great guidance, Bruno. And, and while we are on this topic, another question that we often get is around reporting structure. Right. So who should data leaders work for? Who should own the data and the analytics? What are your thoughts there? So there's a lot of questions within the, the question here. You know, the first one is who should data leaders work for? This is a particularly difficult one because you've got lots of choices, right? You could be uh, having uh, the data teams report under the CFO, uh, the chief financial officer, the CPO, the chief product officer, the CTO, if it's a technical function, or maybe even the respective business unit leaders. Uh, and here, everyone's afraid of answering the question because it's difficult to prescribe based on roles, right? If it goes under the CFO, does it mean that then the initiative is around cost reduction? If it goes under the chief product officer, does it mean now we're going to focus on product analytics only? And so when we ask customers at scale, the answer, you know, it typically it's under the CFO or the CTO. Um, now, while I think that makes sense, I think the question behind the question is also to think about how should you approach data so you can truly enable your company's ability to innovate with it. And there, the trend that we hear is more around data fabric or data mesh. And what I mean by that is the ability to basically, you know, centralize data and decentralize analytics. You know, there's a consensus there of companies that basically realize they want to centralize the metadata management, the policy and the security and then they want to create landing zones. Some customers call them data neighborhoods that they can distribute access to those users in those neighborhoods. People can transform the data, they can augment it, they can analyze it, but they can always do that in a way that is connected to the centralized data strategy and it abides by the corporate policies and the rules. So I advise people to read up on that. There's a great uh, testimonial from uh, the, the head of data at Fidelity who created this idea of neighborhoods, rationalize a hundred plus data warehouse um, into a platform, uh, looking at universal IDs, single customer profiles, uh, central taxonomy, uh, over 3000 data elements and a strong governance function. So neighborhoods is, is a way that I would look at that. So Bruno, as you and I know, and many people do, data analytics, data integration, data processing, it can be a very complex space, especially as we continue to modernize, right? So what is the one gotcha that you've seen for people in this space? So as you plan for change, one of the biggest gotchas is probably data sharing. It's a, it's a very hot topic in our industry today, but data sharing the old way has been problematic and difficult. You know, data sharing historically has been about delivering data and then having people work on it in a way it's kind of like giving a gift card, you know, it's a great thought, but you have to do a lot of work in order to be able to consume the value of it. And so the people that are innovating with data sharing, they think about analytics sharing. They think about putting together rich data applications that are combining data sets, multiple data sets, as well as dashboards, analytics solutions, so then people can consume the value almost immediately once the asset has been shared. So Bruno, I feel like data analytics as a term is thrown around a lot and it's a topic that many organizations, whether you are a new startup or 
someone who is very well versed in the area and has a lot of legacy systems in place. But what are your thoughts and advice for people who just simply want to get started? Yeah, there's a lot of theory around this, right? So when you get started and you plan for change, what should you be doing? Should you be pointing at new use cases and then build a new baseline for performance? Or should you take existing use cases and then see the change from the old uh, to the new? And the reality is that it's neither. It's the use cases that you find have strong sponsorship where the definition of success is shared and the average tenure of a chief data officer is about a thousand days. And the reason for that is because we're often not very clear about what we expect from our data leaders. And so what I would advise you to do is, you know, forget the notion of new and existing and focus on business value from day one. How are you going to measure that and how are you sharing that with leaders that are supporting your initiative? Okay, so we have talked about organizational blueprints. What about the technical blueprints? There are a lot of people talking about the modern data stack and the modern data architecture. So what do you see out there? Uh, well, first of all, we do see an incredible amount of companies moving to the cloud, probably as fast as speed that we've ever uh, noticed in the past. Uh, I think about companies like PayPal, 20 plus petabytes serving over 3000 users. It's migration from Teradata. You know, I think about Verizon with uh, 200 terabytes ingested daily, 100 petabytes stored in BigQuery, and then traditional retailers like Crit and Barrel, 10x more information sources compared to a few years ago, double their return on ads, uh, and uh, with only increasing investment by 20%. So really an incredible amount of innovation going on in the space. And what do they all have in common, these organizations? They have a modern approach, just like you mentioned here, to their data practices and their data platform. So what are the components? The first one is it's an approach that embraces the old and the new, right? Every single one of the most important brands on earth has legacy systems and they have developed leadership over decades and systems before the cloud came along that carried them there right so take the example of an organization like atb financials right saved millions generated millions by moving from sap to the google cloud they built the system they call deep it's an acronym that stands for data exposure enablement platform it's a system that built on BigQuery for real-time data acquisition, enrichment, self-service analytics, and automation. And so that's really kind of attribute number one. Don't ignore or disrespect, if you will, what got you here. Second is don't discard what's going to take you there. And the big trend there is this idea of multi-cloud, right? If you look at research, more than 80% of businesses reported using multi-cloud this year, and more than 90% have a plan in place today to be multi-cloud in the future. So the bottom line here is that companies run a multi-cloud world today and they are gonna be running in a multi-cloud environment tomorrow. And so modern architectures are multi-cloud by default. And then finally, data is no longer a stagnant asset, right? Organizations that win with data, they think about data as part of an ecosystem. You know, the head of data products at Lloyd's uh, of London shared this picture with me. I don't know if you could see it well here, but you can see the dot on the, on the top here, the dark dot is your data and the rest is the world's data. And so what that means is this small dot that I showed you here is just the data that you're struggling to see today. We talked earlier, you know, two thirds of the data in your company is not being analyzed, but you have the opportunity to see the world's data, which brings us to another trend that's, that's really important is this idea of data sharing. You know, the most progressive companies look at data as part of an ecosystem and data sharing is really important. They build data networks. I mean, consider this. Gartner predicts that by 2023, organizations that promote data sharing will outperform their peers on most business value metrics. But only 5% of data sharing programs today correctly identify trusted data and locate trusted data sources. So if you're listening to us, you know, you've got to consider multi-cloud, take into account your legacy, but then think about where are you going next? And really my big question for you is, what is your data sharing strategy? Nicely said, Bruno. That's, that's excellent. I, I completely agree with that. We talked about both organization optimization and technology optimization. So I love that. Thank you. I hope people will reach out to you for more insights. And I also hope that many of those watching did find this useful. So thank you to everyone. And thank you to Bruno, Bruno for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Stephanie.